Hi, I'm Michael, and this is my first video in a series that I want to publish about coffee science. One of the questions I often get in my roasting class is, what are the effects of the roast degree or level of roast and the caffeine that's found in the end beverage? And I typically give the canned response that I learned um, from, I think, another class that I took, which was, the, um, the roasting process doesn't generally reach a temperature necessary to burn off a significant amount of caffeine. Therefore, the variables that determine caffeine content um, are something else. Something else like um, at dark roast, you're burning off more of the bean, and so you're not burning off the caffeine. So your two levels start to move around. You get less coffee material, more per, per volume, let's say, to caffeine. But then I thought, well, maybe there are some studies published that I could find that would give a better answer. And so this video, I'm going to talk about one of those studies I found. And part of what I want to do with this whole series is work through uh, how to read published research. Um, I think it's kind of important, especially with our current climate with COVID and all the research that is coming out. And, you know, everybody's talking about it. So maybe through this video, we could help with some of that as well, or I could help with some of that. So let's dive right in. This specific paper here, you can see the title, Caffeine and Chlorogenic Acids Intake from Coffee Brew, Influence of Roasting Degree and Brewing Procedure. So we know from looking at the title that they're going to look at at least a couple of variables. One variable being... Uh, the influence of the roast degree, and another variable being the brewing procedure. Um, we're also looking at caffeine and chlorogenic acid. So we're, we have a lot of moving parts in this article. The article was published in the International Journal of Food Science and Technology. Um, now, one of the things about this uh, journal is it is a peer-reviewed journal. It is um, Their peer review style is single-blind which means that the reviewers know who the author is, or authors, but the authors don't know who the reviewers are. The reviewers remain anonymous. There are some people who will argue with that process because the reviewers, being peers, can also be competitors. And that means that the, re the, the reviewers are receiving research that uh, they may be competing with. So it's kind of an interesting debate about peer review. The, another option would be double-blind peer review, which means that both the author and the reviewers are blind to each other. They don't know uh, the names of one another. Um, and then there's open review where everybody knows who everybody else is. And we'll look at another paper that's been open reviewed in another video. Uh, back to the paper. This paper was published in 2014. Um, here you can see some interesting information. You can see that it was submitted to the journal in May of 2013 and then accepted in revised form in 2013. So what that tells me is probably what happened is they submit, the authors submitted the paper to the journal and either in the first round when the journal received the paper, they kicked it back for whatever reason and told the authors you need to revise it for this or that reason. Or the journal submitted the paper to peer review and the peers had, sub had feedback for the authors. And then the authors were able to either uh, incorporate the suggested changes from the peers, the reviewers, or they challenged it and explained why they found what they found versus what the peers expected them to find. So there's this back and forth that is able that that can happen between the authors and the reviewers. And then at the end of the day, the journal gets to decide um, whether it gets published or not. Let's see, what else do we have to look at in this paper? Typically, research papers will have several sections that are similar. Um, this section calls this, or this uh, paper calls the first section a summary here. 
Uh, other papers might say might call this an abstract, but basically what you get is a brief overview of the experiment, what they did, and also the 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 results. And what this does is this enables you, if you're researching a topic, you can go through a bunch of different papers and just read the summary or the abstract and get a solid understanding of what the paper is about and whether it pertains to your topic. So that's really good to know. So you can see right off the bat here, they say, brews prepared by boiling showed higher content of the compounds than corresponding filtered coffees. So you can see right off the bat, you know what we're getting into. No surprises there. It's not like a novel where you're, you don't want to spoil the ending. The methods and materials or materials and methods, this is where it gets very sciencey. This is where they, uh, the authors describe in detail the experiment. They're going to tell you all of the information you need to know in order to reproduce the experiment. So you will see that they mention the specific Agtron make and model that they use. So here they mention the East the E10 CP Agtron Analyzer. Um, this way, if you as a reviewer or you as another science um, scientist or researcher know that this specific Agtron unit is faulty, for example, you can, you can let them know that. Or you can use this information to reproduce the experiment on your own, which is another valid part of science. So there we talked about the paper. Now let's dig in to um, the methods and materials. And again, the methods and materials, like I was saying, they give you the nitty gritty of the experiment. And there were some interesting things with this specific experiment that I wanted to bring to light. I'm also gonna show you a really cool app. If you do research um, for school or if you do research on your own, Zotero is a very good app. It's open source, it's free. Coincidentally, it's also used in Wikipedia. When you do citations in Wikipedia, it's a Zotero plugin to Wikipedia that goes out and fetches um, information. So let's say you have a, a DOI, a document identifier for a given research paper. You can plug that in in Wikipedia in the Zotero plugin and it will go and fetch the citation for you and format it for you. It's pretty cool. Uh, I use Zotero to organize all of my research. I use it um, partly for school. That's what all the CSU stuff is, Colorado State University. And these are different courses that I've organized research for. And then you can see where I break it down. These are folders of documents. So for coffee breeding, I have all of these different papers that I've organized in here. And it actually has the document um, for you and you can um, add notes. So this is the paper we're talking about here. Um, this is kind of all the meta information about the paper. You have all of your authors here, you have the title, you have the DOI here, so on and so forth. And then you can add notes. And one of the things I do with a lot of papers is I'll add uh, a note for methods and materials, and then I will summarize in my own words what they go through in the, what they list in the methods of materials, just kind of a, a layman's terms of the methods of materials. And this is what I wanted to talk about on this paper. So what they did was um, they started off with two coffee samples from Brazil, one Arabica and one Robusta, and very specific cultivars. They listed the cultivars uh, in the paper, and you can find this, all of this information in the paper uh, right here. So they used a Katui or Katuai. I'm probably butchering the pronunci pronunciation of that. And then I'm not even going to try that. Apuata for the, um, the Robusta. And interestingly, these seem to be quite old. Unless this, pay unless this research was done in 2009, they were dealing with some stale coffee. Uh, because remember, the paper was published, it was submitted to the journal in 2013. So it could be that they were working with some pretty old stale coffee for this uh, this research. But anyway, neither here nor there. Uh, they told they mentioned that the coffee was uh, naturally processed, and they roasted each coffee in three different batches to produce three different roast degrees. So they produced a light, a medium, and a dark roast according to their standards. 
And the way they roasted, they did not profile the coffee. Any, any of the coffee roasters who were watching, they did not lay a profile on this thing. They didn't worry about their drying phase, their mayored phase, or their roast development phase. They just took the roaster up to 200 degrees Celsius and then dumped the beans in and let it go for seven minutes. And then they dropped the beans into the cooling tray. And then they did, the, they did it again for 10 minutes. And just, just if you imagine the profile, instead of having that nice S curve that most of us uh, roasters like to see, it was just a straight line. And then they did it for 12 minutes to produce a, a dark roast. And then they measured the roast with the, uh, the Agtron meter, like I mentioned earlier, the E10. And then interestingly, and I'm not really sure that uh, I understand this, but they said they correlated the Agtron with the SCA discs. And if you've never used the discs before, you won't understand why I'm confused. But the discs... Each disc represents a range of roasts, and what you do is you can grind the coffee and you set it next to the disc, and um, you decide whether the ground coffee is lighter or darker than the disc, and then based on your understanding, your your looking at the coffee in the disc, you kind of judge, you kind of gauge or guesstimate the uh, roast degree. So it's not very accurate. So I, don't, I wouldn't call that a correlation. And then they ground the beans. Uh, I'm sorry. Then they stored the beans in aluminized valve bags. They froze them, negative 18 degrees Celsius. Um, and then they ground them. They mentioned the uh, Simbali special grinder, the ring nut number four. And then they measured it, and they had... Um, their coffee grind were 400 micrometers or less in size. And um, then they brewed the coffee one of two ways. They either produced a cold drip or uh, they steeped it in boiling water, basically like a French press or if you're in Indonesia, kopi tubruk. Um, some interesting things in the paper I found... They actually had those temperatures reversed. Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, so here. They say two coffee brewing procedures were evaluated. First procedure was filtered coffee water at 92 to 96 degrees Celsius. That's boiling. That's just off the boil. Was left to drip on the ground coffee and paper. And then they mentioned boil coffee at 25 degrees. That's room temperature. So they got those backwards. Um, which is interesting to me that that would make it through both the um, pre-filter of the journal as well as the, um, the peer reviews. There you go. Once they um, brewed the coffee, they again froze it until they could test all of the samples simultaneously. So what they did was they brewed it all, froze it, and then they tested for chlorogenic acids and caffeine content all in one whack. And in the methods and materials, you can see the way they determined the um, acid and caffeine levels. Uh, I have not done a lot of research on these methods, um, but they talk about um, some of the reagents that they purchased. So here you can see um, methanol, specific kind of methanol, where they purchased it, um, crystallized zinc acetate, potassium, let's see if I can say that, hexacyanoferrate, it's got something with iron in it with that ferrate. Um, anyway, I, I don't go into that too much here because I don't know much about that. But those are the methods and the materials. These are, these are the things that we as coffee people are interested in is the the coffee samples they used, how they roasted them, how they brewed them. So we've talked about the paper, we've talked about the methods and materials. Now let's talk about their um, their conclusion, what they, what their data told them. One of the things that they mentioned in the results and discussion was um, there was no statistical difference in caffeine levels between different roasting degrees, considering the same cultivar and brewing procedure. So what they're saying is they controlled for different cultivars of Arabica. So they didn't, they didn't use Arabica typica versus Arabica catui. 
They just used Arabica catui because different plants are going to produce different levels of caffeine. So that's important. That's very good that they did that. And then they also controlled for the brewing procedure. So remember I said they used cold brew and they also used uh, steeped, basically French press coffee. They only compared light roast, dark roast, and medium roast of the French press to each other. And then they compared light, medium, dark roast of cold brew or cold drip coffee to each other. That way the um, brewing procedure or brewing method did not interfere with the ca caffeine levels. And then later in the um, results, they said, um, when considering brewing procedure, boiled coffee showed higher content of caffeine and chlorogenic acids than the corresponding filtered ones although the results were statistically insignificant. So there wasn't a, a, a tremendous variation between the two, but they did show that um, there was higher content of caffeine and chlorogenic acids in the boiled coffees. Why is that? Well, they say that this can be explained by the fact that during boiled coffee procedure, ground roasted coffee stays in contact with water for a longer period, increasing the extraction yield. So that tells me something. That tells me that caffeine and chlorogenic acids, like everything else in coffee, are extracted over time from the grinds with water. Now they didn't go into, in, um, in this study, the amount that's extracted versus the temperature. And I, th I think that that would be an interesting experiment because if you take cold brew coffee and steep, if you take coffee in cold water and steep it for a long period of time, would you extract the same amount of caffeine from it that you could extract from boiling water, right? So is there a maximum amount of caffeine you could extract out regardless of temperature or does hot water assist in the extraction of the coffee. That, that might be an interesting experiment. So I wanted to talk about one table in the paper that I found interesting. This table shows us the caffeine levels um, based on several different variables. So over here on the left, you can see the roasting degree, light, medium, or dark. And then you can also see the brewing methods, filtered, boiled, and then you can see the sample number. So this N column here, I don't know if you can see my, uh, my mouse, but the N column tells you the number of samples that they had for each row. So for example, if you look under the light roasting degree, filtered brewing method, they had two samples. Light roasting degree, boiled method, again, two samples. And then you can see in the next column, uh, it tells you if it's the Arabica or the Robusta. And it tells you the caffeine levels, and then in parentheses is the standard deviation. And this is where it gets interesting for me because I, I don't see how this small of a sample number could give them incredibly useful data, right? So standard deviation means that you have a mean or an average of all of your samples and what they are. So this 92.5 is the mean or average of all of the samples that they, that they measured, and they were measured two samples. So because they had so few samples, it doesn't really give us a solid um, statistic for a mean or a standard deviation. With only two samples, you, your standard deviation is not incredible. So I really wish they would have used more uh, samples. Now, two, of the, two concepts that you can look up afterwards and think about on this is are the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem. And I won't go too deep into these, but the law of large numbers is interesting because it says that as you take more samples, the more and more samples you take, the closer and closer the mean gets to the population mean. So if you think about rolling dice, 
each time you roll a dice, if I roll a die one time, I might I have a one in six chance of getting a one, right? If I roll it um, 5,000 times, my mean is going to get closer and closer to the number three um, because that would be the population mean. And each time I roll, my sample is going to get closer and closer and closer to the population reality. So whenever you can get more samples, do so because that gets your sample mean closer to the population mean. And then the central limit theorem is, is related to the, the law of large numbers. It gets a little bit more statistic-y. But anyway, what these two theories tell us is that we want as many samples as possible to get us closer to um, the average of the population. All right, so we talked about the paper. We, um, we went over kind of how to, how to see the journal that it was published in. Um, this specific journal was peer-reviewed. We know it was single-blind peer review, which means the authors didn't know who the reviewers were, but the reviewers knew who the authors were. Uh, we know that it was revised, the paper was. Um, then we talked about the methods and materials. And remember, we saw that they used some very old coffee, probably. Um, we know that they did some interesting roasting, not uh, profile roasting. They weren't um, roasting this for consumption. They weren't roasting it to make some good coffee, that's for sure. Um, and then we looked at the research conclusion, which was that... Um, the roasting process doesn't necessarily burn off um, more caffeine as you get into darker roasts. You probably do, um, but it's not statistically significant, which means it's, it's not a considerable amount. You're not affecting the caffeine levels in a dark roast coffee enough to, to write home about it. So I hope you enjoyed this video. This is the first in my coffee science series. And in the next one, we're going to start diving into Star Maya coffee, which is an F1 hybrid that I'm very excited about. So thank you for tuning in. Um, click the subscribe button. Click like. Leave me feedback. Um, give me a thumbs up if you liked it. Drop a comment and let me know what you think about uh, these kinds of videos. And if I'm getting too sciencey, let me know. Or if I'm not getting sciency enough, let me know, because I would love to dig in a little bit deeper. Thanks again.